The Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand upright. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, sing, synagogue in, indigent because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the, from the manger and lead it to water? And ought not to this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from his bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said all this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonder things wonderful things set being done to him. For the people of God, thanks be to God. And let's hear it for Sarah with all those words, all those Neapolis and Theatira and all those places in Macedonia. Who's going to pray for the preacher today? Anybody? Okay, Miss Kaylee, I saw her hand go up. If nobody else is going to do it, we'll turn to the 10-year-old again. Thank you, sweetie. Also, I just want to ask, why aren't you praying for the preacher? I don't know why. But also, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Dear Lord, please... Bless Pastor Terry through the struggles she may face as our pastor. She has granted us with um, knowledge on the Lord our God. Please bless, uh, bless her again through any struggles she may face and let her days be filled with joy. Amen. Amen. Thank you, darling. Yeah, I want to know why nobody else wants to pray. <laughs> Hmm. You don't need to be very articulate. You don't have to be grand. You don't have to have beautiful words. It doesn't have to be eloquent. It just has to be from the heart. So we're going to be a praying congregation. I tell you that. We're going to be a praying congregation so that whenever you are in a place where somebody needs prayer, you'll say, I will pray. I will not be shy. I will not be afraid. I will pray with power and with God. So, okay, here we go. Sabbath. Now, my grandparents were old enough to be my great-grandparents. They were born in the 1890s. For them, the word Sabbath meant something. Go forward a generation, it changes a little bit, doesn't it? It's not Sabbath anymore, it's the Lord's Day. Then you go through another generation, it's Sunday. Now what is it for us? It's the weekend, baby. The weekend. Now there's been debate throughout the years in the church on why Sabbath is Sunday or Saturday. You all know why when it became on Sunday instead of Saturday? I had to look this up myself, so I don't think I know this all without looking it up. But Emperor Constantine, the first Roman emperor to accept faith in Jesus Christ, which came through his mother, really. She was the Christian. He thought that he was given a sign that he could conquer with a cross, and he put it on his army shield. It's not exactly, I think, Jesus probably went, oh no, with that one, but he declared Sunday a day of rest, but not in honor of Jesus at the time, but on the venerable day of the sun, which is why it was called Sunday and not Sabbath. Then in 1789, Charlemagne made a decree that prohibited all ordinary labor on Sunday on the grounds that it violated the fourth commandment. Commandment, not suggestion, but commandment. What did God say about the world when God created the world? What did God create on the first day? Light. Oh, we gotta, we got to do some Bible study here. God creates light, separates the light from the day. The darkness calls the day light. 
the light day, the night, dark, dark night. I'm getting mixed backwards today. I'm really muddled today. What else does God create? You don't have to get them in order, but what does God create? Land and sea. What else? You could just sort of say everything, right? God creates everything. What does God say about everything? God says it's what? It's good. It's good. Everything is good, except God gets to the seventh day. God invents the day off. God, yeah, God created the day off, and God doesn't say it's good. What does God say? It's holy. It's holy. Now, for Jews, that's the seventh day of the week, which is Saturday, which begins on Friday evening when the sun goes down, also for Seventh-day Adventists. There was a time in our ministry in West Virginia, we used to collect food at Walmart a couple times a year. They'd let us set up a table. We'd collect food, and at Christmas time, we'd collect gifts and things like that. A man came up to me. It was always me, the ones, the, the crazy people would always come to me and fuss, which was a good thing, because I didn't want them fussing at my church members, but he came up and he said, tell me why your church violates the Sabbath. I was like, you must be a Venice. And he said, I'm not going to say. And I said, you're an Adventist, right? He said, well, yes, I am. And he said, you, you have dishonored God. You have disrespected God. You have disavowed the scriptures by having your Sabbath on Sunday. Why do you worship God on Sunday? And I said, because of the resurrection of the Lord. The Gospel of John says on the first day of the week, and we changed it. And he said, but you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. To which I replied then, I got angry, and I said, tell me one thing your church does for anybody other than tell them they're going to hell. And we got into it then, and I regretted that, because that's not what God asked me to do in that situation. But we fight over the Sabbath, don't we, instead of observing the Sabbath. Let me ask you, when's the last time anyone here observed a real Sabbath day? Anybody? A day of rest? A day of being with Christ and God and celebrating the presence of God. So why don't you rest on the Sabbath, whether it's Saturday or Sunday or whatever day? Pastors, i got to tell you, we don't get Sundays off, so Sunday is usually not the Sabbath day for a pastor. But why don't we rest? Why don't we go to God? You all know the answer, right? We are too what? We're too busy. We're too busy. We're too busy to take time to spend with God. We're too busy to take time for ourselves to rest. We've got some medical people here today. What happens to your body when you don't rest? You get sick. It'll take your immune system down to nothing. You will be cranky. I'm the queen of cranky these days. Just ask my poor little mom at home. I'm just so cranky all the time. I have no patience when I don't have any rest. Anybody else like that? Your patient sort of goes out the window. Diabetes is related to a lack of rest. Obesity is related to a lack of rest. Heart disease, hypertension, they're all related to not resting. So why don't we rest? We're too busy. We're too important to the world to rest. But God says the Sabbath is optional, do you think? What did God say? Thou shalt. Whenever I ask people, can you list the Ten Commandments? This one always gets left off the list because this is one we don't observe, right? It can't be as important as not killing somebody, right? Right? I've never killed anybody, so I'm doing pretty well. I've never committed adultery. I'm really great. But thou shalt honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Shall. Not a suggestion, but a commandment. Pretty good at knowing what commandments apply to other people, aren't we? I know people who can quote me every last thing about homosexuality in the Bible but think this is optional, just like loving your neighbor as yourself is optional. Things are not optional with God here. The Sabbath is a day to be holy, to be with God, to take time. This is what Joshua Herschel, who's a rabbi, Abraham Joshua Herschel, he wrote a book called The Sabbath, which is really a great book. I would recommend it to all of you. In the language of the Bible, the world was brought into being in the six days of creation. Yet its survival depends upon the holiness of the seventh day. Great are the laws that govern the processes of nature, yet without holiness there would be neither greatness nor nature. The holiness of Sabbath drove Jews to treat the day as set apart, which is what the Hebrew word for holy actually means. 
It is not merely a day to recharge one's batteries. It was the day that the rest of the week could not survive without. We cannot survive without Sabbath, and yet we do. All the time we work ourselves into a frenzy. We work ourselves till we're exhausted. We work ourselves until we're grumpy and grouchy and all those other things because we won't take time for God. Now, sometimes we'll use that Jesus story that we just read, Jesus' healing on the Sabbath. We'll use that as an excuse that we're not called to observe Sabbath. But is that what he was doing when he healed on the Sabbath? I don't think so. He wasn't saying it wasn't important. He wasn't saying it wasn't to be honored. He wasn't saying it wasn't to be observed. But he was saying that he is the Lord of the Sabbath, which means that if he wants to heal and do good, he can heal and do good on the Sabbath. That was not a prohibition of the Sabbath at all. But we try to make things legalistic. We try to get our own way. We try to one-up each other, it seems, in Scripture as well as in our lives today. So why would I pick this other lesson to go with it, the lesson from Acts, about all those crazy names like Neapolis and Theatira and Philippi? I went to this place, to that riverside. It's not a huge river. It's more like a big creek. And now there's a church there. But in the days when Paul was there, Macedonia is now present-day Greece, is outside the ancient city of Philippi. It's near the modern city of Thessaloniki, which is Thessalonica in biblical terms, but there's that city continued to evolve through the years, and there's a city there now. You can go through the city of uh, Thessaloniki, and you can see Caesar's Palace. It's not a Las Vegas hotel. It's really Caesar's Palace was there. But you go into the city and you go through the city and you go onto the riverbank and it's a beautiful place. It was never developed other than the church that is there and they've, they've sort of um, dammed up part of the river so there's a baptismal place and people go from around the world to be baptized where Lydia was baptized. Lydia, the first European Christian. Without Lydia, none of us would be here today. Nobody in this church would be here today if not for Lydia bringing Christianity into practice in Greece and spreading it through the countryside of Greece, spreading it through the Roman Empire, spreading it through all of Europe, into the United States, into the colonies, bringing Christianity around the world. We're here because Lydia was there. And why did Paul go to the river? Because he knew there were Jews in Greece. There were no synagogues, but he knew on the Sabbath where to find them. My question is, would God know where to find us on the Sabbath? Would God know where to find us on the Sabbath? You're all like, yes, I'm in church today. I'm so glad I'm here today because I know where I am. Now, I've had people tell me through the years I worship God just as well on the golf course. Yeah, anybody else ever hear that one? And I'm saying to them, unless you're out there enjoying God and focusing on God, if you're screaming God's name, it better be in praise and not followed by the damn it word. Or, oh my God, help me make this shot. It's not exactly worship, is it? So if you want to worship God, you have to worship with all your being. You have to sing your praise to God. You have to be in prayer. You have to take yourself away from the world sometimes to do that. Now, I want us to be in church, not because of me, not because of my sermons. Because, you know, not all sermons are good sermons, unless you, in case you didn't know that, right? Did you all know that sometimes pastors know their sermons really stink? Sometimes you know that because sometimes you've had three funerals in a week and you have no time to work on it. You're up there saying, please, Lord, help me get through this one. Next week I'll have more time. We know that, but you don't come for the sermon. You don't come for the hymns. You don't come in spite of the hymns or the sermon. You come because this is where you are fed by the presence and power of God. This is where you take yourself out of the world and you put yourself in the pew with your brothers and sisters. This is where you pray for one another in your need. This is where you celebrate with one another in your great joy. This is where you live and breathe and get your balance back in the week. But if Jesus were to come, where would he find us on the Sabbath? Would he know where to look? Sometimes it's the golf course. Sometimes it's the scrapbook show. 
am an equal opportunity zapper. Sometimes it's, I didn't say quilting show, Kathy, so don't, don't, don't worry about that. I thought I was going to get to the quilting show. Now, every now and then, I'm not, I'm not saying I have to be here every Sunday, but you need to be in God's presence on the Sabbath, because if we're not going to observe Sabbath, we're going to be so out of touch with God and out of touch with each other and out of touch with our own well-being that we will never again be worth being around. I'm telling you the truth. If you don't take time for God, you will not have a life that is healthy or happy or your soul will suffer because of it. So find the place where you call Sabbath. Find your place with God. Find the place where you can be at peace and at rest. We need rest. You need to rest in God. You need to rest in your faith. You need to pray every day. But you need to take time out to be alone with God and then to be in the company of God's people and celebrate and sing. Leave your crankiness at the door. Leave behind your work and your worry and come here and be in God's presence. And you will know what it is to have Sabbath, to have rest. You'll find yourself going up that mountain and getting closer to each other as you get closer to God. That's why we're singing about stillness and submission and being at rest today. So if you haven't had a Sabbath in a while, I'm going to encourage you to go home and talk to your family about what you need to do in order to have Sabbath. What you need to do in order to have rest in God, in peace, and in quiet, so that you may be refreshed and renewed and made holy once more through the power of God's redeeming love in Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen.